There are some mistakes that men make that uh, they shouldn't. This morning, we're going to talk about things that you should never do right here on Give Me the Bible. Stay tuned. Sunday is always that special time for us to get into the Word of God. And we're glad that you've joined us this morning for the Give Me the Bible presentation. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on the Give Me the Bible program. You know, people often make uh, grave mistakes in their life. I had a man tell me the other day that uh, he didn't really know what happiness was until he got married, and then it was too late. <laughs> well, for him, I guess he considered that uh, marriage relationship a failure. But, you know, I'm convinced today that God wants us to be happy, and there's some things in life that can promote our joy and our happiness as God's children. But there are some grave mistakes that we often make along life's journey. This morning, we want to share with you some things that we believe that we can avoid uh, and understand that there are things that God really wants us to do in order to achieve spiritual success. And I'm going to call on Joe Hancock right now. And Joe, I want to ask you from your vantage point, what are some things perhaps maybe in your mind that you really believe that man should never, ever do? Thanks, Dan. And uh, from my vantage point, I, the first thing I would say was never leave God out of your plans or out of your life, especially for the Christian. If you're a child of God this morning and you make plans without including God in your plans, what kind of plans would those turn out to be? What kind of success maybe would you not have? You know, God loves to direct our steps. And matter of fact, if you look into the New Testament, most everything about our lives from A to Z is covered in the New Testament. Either do this, don't do that, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And God has given us directions for every facet or every area of our life, from, from family to, to friends and dealing with both, to our spiritual success, to our level of, of work in the vineyard. I mean, it's all covered in Scripture. Uh, now, if you want to know what happens when you don't include God, you can look at the, uh, the rich guy there in Luke 12. You recall he was having his crops uh, harvested, and he had the problem because he didn't have all his new harvest. So he said, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll tear down my old barns and build bigger barns. And if you recall the, the words that God spoke to him, uh, he says, you fool, there in verse 20, God says, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things will they be that you've provided? And he says in the next verse, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, sometimes our knowledge or our thoughts about success uh, doesn't add up to what God considers to be success. Uh, this man would have been better off evidently in uh, distributing his wealth to others. That would have been more successful evidently in God's view. Also in the Old Testament, if you go back to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 17, down at verse 5, we get an idea of what God thinks about leaving him out of our plans and out of our lives. In uh, Jeremiah 17, 5, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see when good comes, but it's inhibited the parched places of the wilderness in a salt land in which is not inhabited. He said, But blessed is the man, there in verse 7, who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Obviously, God wants us to include him in our plans. He did back then. He does now. In the book of uh, Proverbs, Solomon, what a wise man. In the book of Proverbs, in the third chapter, in uh, verse uh, 5, we're told that we're to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. He goes on to say in verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Obviously, Dan, that God wants us to include Him. And how, how foolish are we uh, not to include God in our plans. Is it God's will for me to do thus and such? You know, James said back in the New Testament, James chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 15, if the Lord wills, we should do this or that. He was talking there about some who'd planned to go to the big city and sell and make profit for a year. And he says, you know, your life is but a vapor. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. He says, you ought to think and ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do that. No doubt, Dan, we need to keep the Lord in our plans from the time we get up in the morning and have that first prayer to the time we go to bed. 
making plans for events and special occasions, including the Lord our God. He'll direct our paths if we just let him. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate those good words this morning. And I know that the church over in Halls will appreciate you and uh, the spiritual advice that you often offer unto them. Well, there are some things that uh, man should never do. And uh, that certainly was one of them. Now, we're going to ask John Hafner, if he will, to uh, also, uh, John, I know that in your ministry, no doubt there are some sound words of advice that you could offer to others, too, in terms of uh, maybe avoiding some of the terrible mistakes that they might make in life. What else would you consider to be something very important for them to consider? Well, Dan, as we look at Christians living today, we know that the Christian life is not an easy one. Uh, there's going to be struggles. There's going to be temptation and trials. We know that. Uh, one of the greatest things that God has given us to combat that and to provide us the support we need is the church. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons that we neglect the church and make that mistake so often uh, is because we have a misunderstanding of what the church is. Uh, more and more you hear people talk about the church and they're just meaning the meeting place, uh, the building, the brick and mortar. Uh, but the Bible never uses that term in that way. Uh, the church is the people, those believers, the brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, like-minded in the faith, ready to support each other and energize each other's faith. Uh, one of the best places that we can see this in Scripture is in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, now normally we'll go just to verse 25, but I want to start reading before that. Uh, Hebrews 10 starting in verse 24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, now normally when you have a preacher or a teacher bring up this verse, uh, the only phrase highlighted is not forsaking the assembly. Uh, we use that almost as a, a tool to bat someone over the head and said, you need to be here. Uh, but really the aim of the verse is more in encouraging them to be there uh, because of what you can get from gathering together with the saints. Uh, there is great benefit in not neglecting the church, but utilizing them uh, as your support system. Uh, you notice in verse 24, it talks about considering one another. Uh, we care for each other and we're trying to stir up or to provoke love. Uh, we're trying to create more good uh, in our smallest family congregation, growing out into the church universal. Uh, and you can certainly see the good talked about there. Uh, it's even more clear a handful of chapters back in Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, there in verse 12 it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Uh, now that's a danger that every one of us wants to try to avoid. We don't want to depart from God. We want to be there with Him. Uh, we don't want an evil heart of unbelief. We want a good heart uh, full of faith. Uh, and in the very next verse he tells us one of the major ways we can avoid that. Uh, in 3.13 it says, Exhort one another daily while it is called today, uh, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, if we have struggles in the Christian life, which we know we will, uh, we know we have to look to our brothers and sisters, find that support system, find that encouragement that we need to continue on. Uh, in the Apostle Paul's journeys, one of the things that he shows more and more uh, is his care and concern for Christians. Uh, you can see him look to them almost as his children, just because he's helped them starting up. Uh, but in a greater sense, he sees that all of us stand before God, and we need to work together as brothers and sisters. Uh, in Colossians chapter 2, he starts to describe that relationship. Uh, he says how much he wants to be with them, and there in verse 2, he says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Uh, when he describes it in that way, using that imagery, knit together in love, uh, you can really see God's design for the church. Uh, you know, Joe talked about the danger of leaving God out of our plans. Uh, well, let's not leave off God's plan for us. Uh, we are designed to work together in the church, and the fellowship of Christians uh, provides that constructive, helpful environment so that we can be faithful servants of God. Dan? Thank you, John. And uh, John preaches, by the way, for the church over in La Pointer and does a great job, and we appreciate your good words this morning. Now, as we move along, we want to go to uh, the minister for the Angelina Church of Christ in Lufkin, that is our brother in Christ, Paul Hillier. And uh, Paul, I know, too, that you have words that you might share with those who are viewing this telecast today uh, regarding some of the mistakes that people make and, and things that we should never, ever do if we're going to be pleasing to God. What might that be? Well, Dan, you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, just the other day I was listening to uh, sports radio and the guys were talking about uh, 
Alex Rodriguez, <clears throat> and uh, and of course all of the scandals uh, relating to him, his his doctor, his cousin, and you know I just I just thought about to this very thing uh, that uh, you know the company that you keep, and particularly if you surround yourself with people who are shady characters, is going to get you into trouble, and that often happens in life. It doesn't happen just to uh, a Rod; it happens to a lot of people, and uh, and the Bible has something to say to us about this. In fact, when Paul writes to uh, the Christians in Corinth, he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 14, he says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? He goes on to say, and, and what accord does Christ have with Belial? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? Or what agreement uh, does uh, the temple of God have with idols? And I love what he says after that when he says that uh, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Uh, later in the context, Paul urges the Christians there uh, with these words. He says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. John spoke to us just a moment ago about uh, the value of, of the church, uh, the value of our brothers and sisters in the Lord who encourage us. And the writer of Hebrews there in verse 13 reminds us that uh, uh, as, as days go by, we encourage each other each day because we don't want to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We don't want the negative influences of life to draw us back into the world so that we become lost as we once were. And, uh, and that is a very dangerous and yet a possibility for each of us as the children of God to again to be entangled in, in the world, in, in the things of the world, uh, just as the Apostle Peter writes in Second Peter chapter 2. And, uh, and, and, and so I want us to notice exactly what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 6. And notice he doesn't say to not be a friend of people in the world. He doesn't even say, uh, you know, don't hang around bad people. Uh, it's obvious that as, as God's ministers of reconciliation, that there is some interaction that we need, to, we need to have with those who are outside of the kingdom of God. But what he says is, don't be unequally yoked. And so here is the image of, of two oxen who are, who are yoked together. And one is much stronger than the other. And so wherever that stronger ox wants to go, the other will follow. And the Holy Spirit is urging us to, to not be the weak ox that is drug along back in, into the world. We've all heard that saying, uh, you're known by the company you keep. Uh, Dan, somebody put it like this. You're also known by the company that you avoid. And so let's avoid those things that will lead us away from God. Paul, thank you. And some great words of advice there for uh, those of us who are in the kingdom and even those who are outside that body of Christ. It's something that all of us should learn every day and, and equip ourselves to serve God in a more effective way. Now, we're going to call on Neil Thurman right now with the University Church here in Tyler, Texas. And, and uh, Neil, I know that some say that we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world and where people actually just step on one another to uh, get where they want to be in life. But would you say that is wise? or that really is a tragic mistake that men often make. Dan, I believe you're right with that, especially, you know, Joe has talked to us about how we ought to recognize our success and things like that. And something else we ought to consider is how we get there. How do you get to that success? And if we, if one advances himself at the expense or at the detriment of others, it is not going to be pleasing to God. Consider what God said to the prophet Amos, Amos chapter 8, uh, in the beginning in the second verse, it said, The Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will pass by them uh, anymore. Uh, and the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make poor of the land uh, fail. Uh, saying, uh, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, uh, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy 
for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. And the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this? And everyone mourn who dwells in it, and it shall swell like the rivers, heave and subside like the rivers of Egypt. And God goes on to talk about the fact that he's going to depart from them or to destroy them because of this. And if we recognize the fact that the Lord has never been pleased with such behavior as getting ahead by stepping on others. Even the Lord, as he uh, spoke to the, of the scribes and Pharisees there in Matthew chapter thir uh, 23, he said in verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation that the statement being there that because of what you have done. You know, when we try to measure success, as Brother Joe has already mentioned, we need to recognize that getting there or the way that we succeed may at times be just as important, if not more important, than what we have accomplished because of what we have cost others. When we think about how the Christian is to live, the Apostle Paul lets us know that the call for godly living is one that calls for us to care for the needs of others. He says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each one look out for not only his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And as we think about that, Dan, we should recognize as Christians, the whole is better when we think about everyone and not just ourselves. Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, we then who are strong ought to bear up the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. As we move forward in our life toward God and in his presence, we'll find that when we live in care of others, we are greater ourselves. Thank you, Neil. And that really is the way Jesus lived. He lived for other people. He not only lived for them, but he died for them as well. Thank you very much, Neil. Now we're moving to uh, Perry Cowan with the Shady Grove Congregation uh, over near Big Sandy. And Perry, I know that in our world today, we have a lot of folks that believe that the world owes them a living, so to say. But doesn't the Bible really address that concept? And isn't that a tragic mistake that, that people often find themselves in in today's world? Well, I would agree with that, Dan, that, that there are so many that, that make that mistake. And it is a mistake indeed to believe that the world owes you a living. Uh, there are many in the world today that, that seem to believe this very thing, uh, that they are entitled for whatever reason it might be. They are entitled because of uh, one situation or another or maybe even from events that happened to uh, the ancestors in, from a past time. Uh, but the fact is, you know, this being a very popular concept uh, and it, it lends itself toward, uh, you know, the, the welfare support and food stamps and uh, you know, just this widespread attitude of, of a, an entitlement. In other words, I'm entitled to it just because of who I am. So that oftentimes expectations are present even when gratitude is not present. You know, we should always be uh, thankful for the things that we have and the things that we receive. I, I remember one situation that I'm uh, known of involving those who uh, seem to be struggling with uh, some, some financial concerns. Uh, and there was a, another, a fellow Christian who gave them a very generous, very generous contribution to help them out. And you would think that they would receive a, you know, thank you very much, we really do appreciate your help. But actually what was overheard from one of those who received the help was something like this. Well, they can afford it. They won't even miss it. They're well to do. Uh, we're not entitled to what someone else has just because they have more than we have. 
that doesn't give us the, the, the right, the entitlement to, to expect them to do something for us uh, just because they are in that position. Uh, we should be grateful that they're willing to share and express that gratitude for it. You know, the world gives us opportunities. The Bible tells us that we should take advantage of the opportunities we are given. And so long as we are able, we should take advantage of the opportunities that God has provided for us by working for the things that we want, the things that we have need of. Uh, I've, I've known of those also who have, are drawing checks from from unemployment compensation or receiving food stamps or in other ways receiving assistance from a welfare program who will not seek for or will not accept a job because if they took the job they would lose the benefits. We need to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. So with those things being said, let me give you the Bible. If you would take your Bible, open it to the second uh, writing of the uh, church in Thessalonica, we can read these things. It would be very beneficial if our government authorities would revamp the welfare system to comply with this. It says, For you yourselves know, not, uh, know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil day and night. And then he went on and said, if any will not work, neither shall he eat. Something that we should be thinking about. Thank you, Perry. Good advice uh, for those that really want to get ahead in life, get a job. Who was it that said the best way to uh, deal with poverty is to go out and seek employment and get a job? And that's the old-fashioned way, however, but that's God's way. Now, you know, we do have a lot of people in our world today that are clamoring for certain things who believe they're entitled to. We've had a big war going on over in Israel and in the uh, Gaza Strip, uh, where both of them feel like they have right to certain land area. And God gave it, no doubt, to the Israelites many, many years ago. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily belongs to them today. It was a promise. And when they turned away from God, as we often do in our life, sometimes we lose those blessings that God gave unto our fathers in the past. It behooves us to not make that mistake. Now, we want to go in this uh, last segment of the program this morning to Randy Foreman. Uh, Randy preaches for the Corinth Road Church of Christ over in Jacksonville, Texas. And uh, Randy, I know that uh, as God's people, sometimes we fail to remember that we cannot live like the world and hope to go to heaven. You cannot live like the devil, can you, and, and believe that you're going to please God and go to heaven? Absolutely not, Dan, and thanks for the introduction. You know, many believe today that a day of reckoning is not coming. Only 41% of all Americans believe that there's going to be a judgment day. You know, this program, Give Me the Bible, is all about the Word of God and the answers that it has to the issues of life. And because I firmly believe that the Bible is its own best commentary, Let's listen to what Jesus taught about that day of reckoning, that day of judgment. In Matthew 25, 31 through 46, our Lord is teaching in this passage about that which is going to happen in the future and really is happening right now. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will say, set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, 
Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then we'll also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Dan? Thank you, Randy, and said well. Uh, you know, Jesus in that text, as Randy explained, uh, helps all of us understand that you just can't live like the world. You can't. We have to come out from among them and be separate. That's the teaching of God Almighty. We thank all of you for being our guests this morning right here on Give Me the Bible. We thank all of our panelists for the work that they have done in making this program successful here today. We hope that you'll digest the things that have been said and that they can be beneficial and helpful to you not only today but in days to come as well. We offer a free DVD presentation of the Bible just simply entitled Searching for Truth and you may be one out there today who's searching for that truth that we find only in the Word of God. We ask that you write for it. Call us at that 800 number. It is free. Uh, there is no cost involved. We're happy to send it to you postpaid and no one's going to be calling you or, or responding to you unless it is at your request. Join us next time for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Jesus has saved us and made us His own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven. God's family. Some go before us, we'll all meet again, just inside the city, as we enter in, there'll be no more party, with Jesus we'll be.